Hello, I'm Walter Wallace. I'm the uh, coordinator of the Rockingham Historic Preservation Commission. On behalf of the commission, I'd like to warmly welcome everyone to the program, Bellows Falls and the Raging Canal, a social history of the Bellows Falls Canal. This is the second of the commission's 2021 speaker and workshop series made possible through funding from the D Vermont Division for Historical Preservation and the National Park Service. Many hands make light work. So I also want to thank the Rockingham Public Library and the Bellows Falls Historical Society for their support of this program. When we hear about historic preservation, we all too often think about conservation and restoration of bricks and mortar, clappers and Victorian gingerbread porches. Historic preservation is so much more. It is about landscapes and stories that help us better understand our sense of place, look into the future with a grounding in the past. It is a way of learning. Tonight's speaker is Bellows Falls native son, David Deacon. Graduating from Bellows Falls High School in 1981, David attended Marlboro College and then went on to the University of North Carolina for a master's degree in folklore. His concentration in American history was at Syracuse University where he earned a master's and doctorate. The Bellows Falls paper mill industry features prominently in his research and writing. He's an adjunct professor of history at SUNY at, uh, uh, at Syracuse. And uh, tonight's talk is from a forthcoming book that he's working on, The Social History of Our Town. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Deacon. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is uh, part of work I've been doing for, for quite a number of years at this point, and I'm just very happy to share it. Uh, I'm going to cover the, the history of the canal starting uh, in 1792, and ambitiously, I'm going to uh, take it up to 1928, when um, the canal became uh, a hydroelectric canal. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, um, uh, showing some images. Uh, the sources of the images in this come from my own collection, but also from the Bellows Falls or the Rockingham Public Library and uh, from the Bellows Falls Historical Society. So I thank them for, um, for sharing images with me as well. Let's see, and to uh, share the screen, here we are. This is a, woodcut of Bellows Falls from uh, probably the 1850s, showing a very sort of idealized view of the, of the village. I, I dated to the 1850s because right in the middle of the image is the Island House Hotel that was built in 1852. All right, uh, and then let me get to, oops. Here we are. The canal is over here. Okay. In August of 1871, the Bellows Falls Times published a humorous, if inaccurate, description of Bellows Falls, originally published in the Boston Herald. The author of the letter signed himself Harry's Boy and he was very critical. He admitted that the village was pretty, but suggested that people visit to, quote, see how people learn to labor and wait. He wrote that the people in Bellows Falls were eager to, quote, expatiate on the tremendous water power which the Connecticut presents to the capitalists, end quote, but that they lack the enterprise to actually exploit that water power. It is a relief, he wrote, to most of the old inhabitants to know that their water has not been contaminated with dye stuffs and chemicals if it has not turned any turbines. About the canal, he wrote, that the locks are in rather dilapidated condition, but the memories of the busy scenes once enacted are sufficient in the eyes of the legal voters 
to atone for their present quietness. Harry's boy commented on the business leaders of the village, noting as an improvement that a person who needed to do business with the bank could now do it in the bank building. Years ago, he wrote, one wanting money on his own or another's paper was obliged to visit the foot of the canal where seated on a pine log, the cashier of the bank from a pocket equally filled with fish hooks, fish worms and bank bills discounted the farmer's note. A.N. Swain, the editor of the Times commented on the letter in another column. He noted that when people first read the article, they were indignant. Swain referred to the writer as Rip Van Winkle Jr., noting that his criticism was decades out of date. He wrote, quote, the idea of speaking of our people and the raging canal as they existed 30 years ago in the present tense makes us fear that his communication was written like much of the foreign correspondence of the New York World or Herald in their own offices at home. The term raging canal, of course, is ironic. At a half mile long, the Bellows Falls Canal never raged. The term comes from a comic song about the Erie Canal published in 1844. The Times used the term at least twice. The other time was in a poem about business conditions in Bellows Falls published in 1859. The ironic description of the canal underscored the point that while the canal was important to local development, it was not financially successful before its industrial period in the 1870s. We can divide the history of the canal into three periods. The period of transportation from 1792 to 1866, the period of water powered industry from, 1820, uh, 60, from 1866, excuse me, to 1926, and the period of hydroelectric power from 1926 to the present. The early canal was modest with eight locks to raise boats a total of 52 feet. The original canal was about 22 feet wide and four feet deep. Eventually the locks could handle boats or rafts of 54 feet long and 18 feet wide. L.S. Hayes, the town historian, <clears throat> estimated that the Atkinson family in England never made more than 20% of their original investment. Hayes notes correctly that this was not unusual for investment in other canals. Historians write of three revolutions that happened close together in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the market, transportation, and industrial revolution. Americans were interested in economic development but lacked the transportation to get goods to market. Industry would have to wait until roads, canals, and railroads could transport those goods. This development started slowly in the 1790s and accelerated after the War of 1812. The first phase of transportation development were roads, but sometimes shipping this way was more expensive than the value of the goods being shipped. Water travel was much cheaper, but rivers were occasionally obstructed by falls. The solution was short navigation canals. On the Connecticut, a series of six canals had to be built between what's now Windsor Locks, Connecticut and Wilder, Vermont. And these had to be built with private money. In Bellows Falls, this money came from the Atkinson family, including the brothers, John, Francis and Hodgson, and John's father-in-law, Ebenezer Storer. The Atkinsons were an English family of merchants. John Atkinson was the family's representative in America. Storer was a treasurer of Harvard College. Before the revolution, John Atkinson had been a merchant in Boston, but as a loyalist, fled to Nova Scotia. Between 1778 and 1780, he fought with the Loyalist Massachusetts Volunteers. After the war, he returned and settled in New York, where he invested in land speculation schemes in New York, Ohio, and Western Virginia. Late in life, he moved to Bellows Falls. Apparently short on cash, 
By the end of his life, he was forced to relinquish his interests in the canal. The fact that the capital for the company was mostly in British hands made development of the property difficult. In fact, the construction of the canal was much more difficult than the Atkinsons expected and took a decade to complete. In 1797, a flood caused a great amount of damage to the work already completed and destroyed the two upper locks. This is a map, um, a, a 20th century copy of a map uh, originally drawn in 1803. Um, before 1802, when the canal was finally completed in its first form, there was little to Bellows Falls. In 1871, the Times reported that when Samuel Guile, one of the first papermakers, moved to town soon after 1800, there were only 11 houses and that most of the village was forest. A map of the land of the village from 1803 showed that much of it was fairly evenly divided between the Atkinsons and William Page, the engineer who oversaw the construction of the canal. The exceptions were land owned by Pelatius Sargent, over here, little pieces uh, over here, uh, up, uh, up north as well. There's a, um, um, uh, Tuttle and Caleb uh, and uh, Tuttle on both sides here. Um, um, a land owned by a Samuel Cutler over here. Um, uh, 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 there was a, a down here. There's another lock, uh, lot of five acres sold to Kingsbury and Blake. Uh, this is the first paper mill in town the Kingsbury and Blake Mill built in 18, starting in 1802. Um, Elisha and Ephraim Kingsbury had built a mill in Alstead, New Hampshire in 1793. That mill showed great potential, but suffered financially. Finally, in 1800, Bill Blake joined the firm and the mill seemed to be on better footing. Kingsbury and Blake seemed eager to take advantage of the new water power offered by the Bellows Falls Canal and bought their lot as soon as the canal was finished in 1802. The deeds for the first mill show that Blake and Kingsbury bought a total of five and three quarter acres of land, quote, under the hill where Major Sargent's old house formerly stood by the eddy below the falls. This is the early reference the earliest reference I have seen to the area around the lower part of the canal as under the hill, a term that we still use. Uh, there is little information about the operation of the canal in its first decade. Lyman Hayes apparently had access to canal company records, but he mostly mentions the meetings of the company. We see a hint of Atkinson's financial problems in the deeds. Between 1802 and 1810, he gradually sold land and mortgaged his interests in the company to his brothers. Conditions started to improve for the canal after the War of 1812. The war generally stimulated national economic development with industry in Lowell, Massachusetts, and the beginning of the Erie Canal in 1817. About this time, Atkinson moved to Bellows Falls. In 1819, Alexander Fleming, Atkinson's son-in-law, moved to town to be an agent of the Canal Company, a position he served until 1866. Atkinson died in 1823, and the next year, his estate sold his interests in the company to Fleming. The operations of the canal were more fully controlled locally, and it gradually prospered even if it did not return a lot of money to the Atkinsons. This is a, a view of Bellows Falls, uh, I think probably from about the 1820s. Uh, it shows the original bridge across the Connecticut over here, the canal over on the other side with a very steep hill. Uh, the perspective is compressed and uh, certainly not to scale. 
but I think the, uh, the buildings in the foreground are Bill Blake's paper mill. Business grew. In 1812, Bill Blake's paper mill burned and he rebuilt a mill that was much larger. In 1817, he opened a printing office and published books in a newspaper, the Vermont Intelligencer. William Hall and Henry Atkinson Green, Hetty Green's father-in-law, ran a general store in the square. The canal company operated another store and ran its grist and sawmills. This is the canal company's sawmill from about 1870. Flatboats traveled up the river with merchandise and rafts of timber and shingles traveled down the river. Business and lumber traveling south seems to have been at least as important as the merchandise traveling north. The lumber consisted of long logs, old growth pine. The logs would be assembled into rafts held together by planks pegged into the ends of the logs and secured by ropes. The days of the early log drives ended in the 1830s. And when drives started again in 1869, the Bellows Falls Times noted, quote, the advent of a company of rivermen in this place last week was a novelty to most of our population, while the older residents declared that it reminded them of old times. You'll notice that they use the term rivermen. Uh, people in New England did not uh, use the word lumberjack. There, you were either a woodsman who cut down the trees or a riverman who drove the trees down the river. Um, sometimes they were the same people, but not always. The Times reported, 40 years ago, occasionally, 200 rivermen would concentrate at this point at one time, their rafts accumulating above the dam and waiting their turn to get through the locks. Sometimes in the night, the lock tender would be bribed to let someone through with his rafts, whereby he would be enabled to get his lumber to market ahead of his turn. At other times, the men would work hard all day then spend most of the night in ring wrestling. Generally, some musicians would be found among them. And on one occasion, they got out a couple fiddlers and over a hundred men danced in the square nearly all night. These rivermen may have seemed a little wild or at least exotic, but this indicates the maturing of society locally. On one hand, we have the mercantile community, including Atkinson, Fleming, two distantly related families of Greens, Henry Atkinson Green and Henry Francis Green, Bill Blake, William Hall, Samuel, and later his son, James Cutler, and others. They formed a local elite and were gen genuine, generally were united in religion. Samuel Cutler, a merchant, was a leading force in founding Emmanuel Episcopal Church. And most of this elite class were members of the church. John Atkinson, whose stone is on the left here, um, the Greens and Bill Blake, Bill Blake is on the right, are buried within a few yards of each other at Emmanuel. <clears throat> on the other side, there are people who came through the canal and the canal became associated with the transient and working people. This is a stone for the Henry Atkinson Green family, um, showing here the graves of uh, Edward Henry Green, his son, and Hetty Green, um, wife of Edward Henry Green. It was not until the 1830s that the canal finally came into its own. Alexander Fleming continued to consolidate his control. In 1821, he bought Bill Blake's printing office on the square, and in 1825, bought Blake's paper mill. Blake built a new mill at Twin Falls in Westminster. The canal company started buying land, over 300 acres of village land including much of the land Atkinson and Page had owned in 1803. By 1834, the Atkinsons in England had granted Fleming power of attorney. This meant that the canal enjoyed local control with three resident agents, Fleming, 
his brother-in-law, Henry Francis Green, and James Cutler. About this time in the middle of the 1830s, Asa Wentworth, a merchant in Alstead, New Hampshire, together with his brother Merrick, moved across the river into Bellows Falls. He bought what was called the Mammoth Block on the south side of what we call, um, on the south side of the square, what we call the Howard Block today. This is Asa Wentworth. This was the house uh, that Asa Wentworth built in the 1830s. And uh, the big building in the middle of this photograph is the Mammoth Block. Notice the Bellows Falls Times office next to it. Um, um, pieces of this building are still in the modern Howard Block today. Uh, the photograph was taken by Frederick Blake, comes from a, a, a book of photographs he published in the 1880s. He was a devout, Asa Wentworth was a devout Episcopalian and served on the vestry of Emanuel Church for many years. His son, W.P. Wentworth, was an architect who worked with Richard Upjohn on Emanuel Church and designed the Masonic Hall, the Flatiron or Corner Pharmacy building on the square over here. And, um, oops, I'm sorry. Let's, let's see, uh, right, there we are. Um, the Corner Pharmacy um, building and the Centennial Block. Uh, and also the brown block on the square in Bellows Falls. In later decades, as the Bellows Falls Times published reminiscences of the canal and its navigation period, it focused on memories of the flatboats run by Wentworth and his contemporaries. In 1874, a correspondent remembered when the eddy at the south end of the canal was, quote, full of freight craft awaiting their turn to pass up through the locks. The author wrote, quote, setting poles, as the boatman called them, with one end braced against the broad shoulder of the inland sailor, so to speak, and the other thrust against the side of the canal, pushed slowly uh, along upstream the heavily loaded boat. In these days, the Wentworths were young men, and faithfully supplied much of the surrounding territories with dry goods, salt, tea, codfish, tobacco, West Indian sugar, and even New England rum, 90% proof. This is a photograph taken recently. The brown block uh, is, the, is the sort of uh, blue green block with the turret on the corner. Um, Another story published in the Times in 1891 described a landing behind where the Brown Block was built in 1890. The reason for the landing was that there was a bakery and also a well, which was celebrated for the quality of its water. The boatmen loaded bread while they unloaded Wentworth's cargo. The Times reported, it is easy to imagine a busy scene at this landing any time from 1840 to 1850. Word has passed around that the old flatboat, Colonel Wentworth, was coming along through the locks and would soon arrive at the landing. The crowd gathers and soon the cargo of West India rum, molasses, etc., awaits unloading. The well sweep is put in motion drawing the cool water, some to be drank clear and some to be mixed with a part of the cargo. When the brown block was built in 1890, the well remained in the basement where apparently it still is, one of the tangible reminders of the navigation period on the canal. This is the door into uh, the basement of the brown block. Uh, it's interesting to see how the, the street level has changed. Um, in 1899, W.H. Fuller, a correspondent from Bennington, wrote to the Times that the flatboats traveled mostly in the spring and fall, but seldom in the winter in the summer because of low water. He wrote, I remember the great rafts of logs and the lumber rafts with shingles, lath, 
clabberts and often woolen farm produce on board. We boys used to enjoy rides through the locks up and down. And it was a great treat for us when we could assist in pushing open the great gates that let them through the locks from one crib to another. This is a photograph um, from Fall Mountain across from Bellows Falls taken in 1868, uh, right before uh, the uh, next phase of development, the, the um, international paper company mills started to be built. In the 1830s, the canal company started to use more of its water for power. In 1832, it sold a water pr privilege and land to John Kerry, one of the investors and like Atkinson from England. This is the mill that the, uh, this is the mill that Kerry built. Today, it's the Adams Grist Mill. In 1836, a developer started to build a cotton mill about where the Moore and Thompson mill would eventually be. The canal company started to open a branch of the canal east from the upper locks to the riverbank. The developer built the foundation but lost his capital during the financial crisis and depression of 1837. This is a close up of the same photograph. The foundation for this mill is down here. The foundation of the mill remained on the riverbank for almost 50 years, a constant reminder of the limits of the village's prosperity. The Wentworths did a prosperous business, but the canal company still was not financially successful. Again, the evidence is in the deeds. In 1832, Fleming, Henry F. Green, James Cutler, and even the bank cashier, William Henry, borrowed money using their land and mill properties as collateral. The money uh, lender was Jabez Hills, an eccentric miser who lived as a hermit in a room um, in a building he owned on the square. Through foreclosure, Hills gradually accumulated land in Bellows Falls, including much of the west side of the square. This is a photograph of Jabez Hills uh, taken probably shortly before he died. Um, through foreclosure, Hills gradually accumulated land in Bellows Falls including much of the west side of the square. In 1846, the old Blake paper mill, then owned by Fleming and Green, burned and the business failed. Hills foreclosed on the property, but refused to do anything with the land. Like the cotton mill, the foundation of the paper mill and remnants of the mill pond remained until 1869, when Hills finally leased the land to the paper mill developer, W.A. Russell. This effectively removed much of the industrial land in the village from circulation. Uh, by 1846, the talk of the town was no longer the canal, but now railroads. The canal had brought some mercantile prosperity to the town, but the local elite hoped for greater development. Flatboats were limited, and steamboat travel on the river was never more than a hope. Sure, steamboats had come to town. Uh, in 1826, the Barnet made a trip from Hartford, Connecticut to the lower locks of the canal. It was greeted with great fanfare, but made the trip only once. In 1831, a small tugboat named the William Hall traveled to Bellows Falls but was too large to pass through the locks. The crew used oxen to haul the boat through the square. The boat made one trip. One season in the middle of the 1830s, a Captain Griswold of Bellows Falls operated a steamboat carrying freight and passengers from Hartford to Bellows Falls. But through this time, steamboat travel remained limited. Railroads offered an alternative. They could handle more freight and passengers at a lower cost and greater speed. 
The Bellows Falls Gazette raised the possibility of a railroad up the Connecticut Valley in 1843. Clear the track, the Gazette announced. It described a meeting of interested residents chaired by Asa Wentworth. They passed a resolution stating the town's support for railroad development. They pointed out that places near railroads had an economic advantage over places more distant. The resolution stated, quote, the most productive soil and the most abundant unfailing water power remote from railroads or steamboat navigation are comparatively valueless. The section of the country in which we live is we fear rapidly approaching this condition. The ideal route, townspeople agreed, was from Boston to Bellows Falls to Rutland via Mount Holly and on to Middlebury and Burlington. The proposal had the support of Alva Crocker, the leading railroad developer in New England and the chief organizer of construction of the Hoosick Tunnel. Crocker visited Bellows Falls in November, 1843 and was greeted by Wentworth and other community leaders. The Gazette gave its hearty support to Crocker, dubbing him the rousation engine of the railroad plan. The first trains over the Cheshire line from Fitchburg reached Bellows Falls in 1849. The Vermont Valley Railroad arrived in 1851. This is a view from probably the late 1860s of um, uh, the railroad development on the square with the roundhouse. Um, you can see the, the passenger depot here, a freight depot here. Um, uh, the bridge crossed the canal right here. Um, uh, the first trains over uh, the Cheshire line from Fitchburg reached Bellows Falls in 1849. Bellows Falls became an important hub, a place where four lines met. This destroyed the traffic on the canal. W.H. Fuller remembered that flatboats stopped passing through the canal by 1848. Lyman Hayes recorded a memory of lumber rafts passing through the locks in 1854 but by 1856, the locks were impassable. The railroads did not bring prosperity to the village immediately, although they were vital to industrial development in the 1870s, as was the canal. In 1859, a commentator in the Times noted that business on the railroads was dull, um, but they transformed the village and especially the island and Canal Street. By the end of the 1870s, there were two roundhouses and turntables on the island, freight and passenger depots, um, coal houses and freight sheds. There were businesses that were convenient to the railroad, the Wilson's wholesale grain business, and importantly, the Island House Hotel. The Island House was built in 1851 and catered to summer travelers. Usually it was not open between September and June. And because of this, proprietors came and went quickly. Uh, in 1860, after a fire destroyed the Bellows Falls Hotel on the site of the current Hotel Wyndham, and the Island House had closed for the season, the Vermont Phoenix in Brattleboro declared with exasperation a village of some 1,100 inhabitants without a hotel is like a large house without a bedroom. On the other side of the canal, Canal Street was also undergoing a transformation, largely residential before the 1850s, including the two federal style Cape Cod houses, one of which had been um, uh, Cape Cod houses once occupied by lock keepers and two other Greek revival cottages, one of which had been known by Asa Wentworth's brother Merrick. Another view of the north end of the canal showing these houses as they look today. And these are uh, the, the house in blue was Merrick Wentworth's house. 
Um, gradually, the street took on a more working class identity. In 1858, Norman Harris built a block of shops and tenements that after a fire in 1906 was rebuilt in its present form, eventually becoming the Exner block. Uh, here, this long building here is the Harris block. Um, and you can see the canal is right below it. There's a, the bridge across the canal in what today is Depot Street. The square as it looked in 1868 is here. In 1891, the Times remembered the Harris Block in its early days, uh, noting that it was alive with its scores of dirty and ragged inhabitants. There were restaurants, notably Edson Dewey's restaurant at the head of the square, this building, now the Coffee Roasters, groceries, including one owned by Samuel Cragen across uh, um, uh, from the from Depot Street, that's this building here, and one in the bottom of what was then called Whiteman's Hall, up here, um, directly north of Dewey's Restaurant. This building, which in its last form was home to Una's Restaurant, had a restaurant on had an entrance on Canal Street. Eventually. Cragen sold his store to S.D. Piper, who in 1872 advertised, quote, West India goods and groceries. At various times, there were oyster houses on the street and according to rumor, rum shops. Vermont passed a prohibition law in 1850, so these were illegal. There was a jail on the street. And during the Civil War, there was an arsenal of 75 muskets ready in case of an attack. There was also a bit of disorder on the street. In 1859, the Times reported a burglary of one of the houses. The burglar, the burglar stole clothes, money, a watch, and tomatoes ripening on a windowsill. The Times reported assaults and rum riots. In 1876, Selectman F.A. George opened a, quote, house for tramps. And the Times reported that it was the only unquestionable temperance house in the state. In November of 1876, during a bitterly contested presidential election between Republican Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat Samuel Tilden, the Times reported, a bright little Republican boy in town got permission of his parents to stay at Union Hall on Tuesday Eve and hear the election returns. But, mid, but about midnight, he went home saying he didn't want to stay any longer. Tilden was elected, for there was a drunken row on Canal Street. This is a view. This is um, uh, Dewey's restaurant. You can see the Harris Block over here uh, and Whiteman's Hall over here. This is probably from uh, the late 1860s. Uh, and so, um, sort of what it looks like today, um, Dewey's restaurant has been uh, enlarged and rebuilt a number of times through the years. And what had been the Harris block is down here, now the Exner block. This shows the fire in this building in 1906. Uh, the brown block is, is behind it here. This is what it looked like after it was rebuilt. Uh, the fire had started in the Bellows Falls Bakery and the bakery remained there after the building was rebuilt. And there's the building today. By the early 1880s, the village hoped to clean up the street. They paved it with granite blocks. Merchant and real estate developer Amos Brown bought the Harris Block, painted it, and sought better tenants for its shops. In 1892, he built uh, the new block at the head of the street. That year, the Times commented, good people are working hard to improve the morals of this town. Canal Street was important 
because it was the first impression many people had of the village. A visitor had to travel from the depot either to Bridge Street or up Canal Street to get to the square. This made the appearance of Canal Street and also the depot tremendously important. Um, so this is, you can see the canal here, the Harris block, um, um, uh, the bridge across the canal and the various um, houses along the street. Uh, the, the railroad depot is over here and the roundhouse is here. Um, by 1891, the Times began to push for improvements, a new bridge on Depot Street, and ideally a new passenger depot. The old depot had stood since 1852, and by 1891, the Times commented, the old passenger depot looks out from a grim old age. It was renovated several times, but would not be replaced until after it burned in 1921. As for bridges, by 1892, the old wooden covered bridge on Depot Street was rotting and could not handle traffic safely. It was replaced that year with an iron bridge. The abutments were thoroughly rebuilt, adequate to the weight of teams carrying freight. The bridge stood until 1908 when it was condemned. The Times noted then that the bridge's railing and stress pillars are in a badly corroded condition. To replace the bridge, the town hired an architect from Boston named J.I. Worcester. He prepared to sink pilings to bedrock 40 feet below the canal surface. By May 1909, the Times announced that the old iron bridge had been removed and crews were building the abutments and forms to hold concrete. The new concrete bridge, completed at a cost of $12,000, was a source of considerable pride. So here's that new bridge under construction. There it is completed. This is an interesting view from that bridge north, the railroad bridge and the old arch bridge um, in the background. And that's what the, the bridge looks like today. The railroads transformed Canal Street and the island north of Bridge Street. And beginning in the 1860s, industrialists began to transform the canal itself. In 1860, the Vermont Phoenix in Brattleboro asked the question of, quote, why Bellows Falls has, was not doing the business to which by her position, she is legitimately entitled. The only response suggested was, with emphasis, lack of enterprise, end quote. Two people particularly were to blame, Jabez Hills, who controlled much of the land under the hill, and George Atkinson, who in 1857 took ownership of the company. He remained in London, but did not seem interested in operating the canal. Finally, in 1866, Atkinson agreed to sell the company to a group of investors in Keene. The Times reported, for more than 40 years, this property has been held in trust by a gentleman a resident of London, England, and all attempts to purchase it have failed until the present sale. And the waters of the Connecticut have rolled past this point, scarce turning a wheel on their course. In 1868, the canal changed hands again. And finally, in the summer of 1869, William A. Russell of Lawrence, Massachusetts, bought a controlling interest and now the canal was ready for development. Russell and later his two sons owned the canal until 1912. W.A. Russell started modestly with a single mill shown in the lower left called the New England Pulp Company. This made only ground wood pulp for paper. Russell working with bank cashier James H. Williams 
was able to convince Jabez Hills to lease the old mill property that had burned in 1846. By the spring of 1870, Russell started work on rebuilding the dam and brought in 2 million feet of lumber for the job. The new dam raised the water level and increased the volume of water in the canal. Workers cleared the canal of debris and dug it deeper. In March of 1871, the Times announced a new season of work on the canal, commenting that the Russell family, quote, mean business and had proved it, end quote. In the 1871 season, the company removed the upper locks to create a flume. Much of the lower end of the canal was, quote, covered tight like a pent stock. Russell started work on a paper mill, the Fall Mountain Paper Company. The Times praised the Russells saying they talk little but execute much. This is a view of uh, the paper mills uh, taken probably in the later 1870s uh, from the New Hampshire side of the river. Again, probably a slightly earlier, uh, but in the 1870s, showing the paper mill development. Uh, the old pulp mill is here. And you can see the canal with its pilings down through here. Um, and of course, the railroad crew in front. Um, this is the, with the canal, the railroad, and the paper mills. This is what was making Bellows Falls prosperous. Russell worked carefully and thoroughly. Very quickly, he bought the canal company, as well as the Tucker Toll Bridge across to New Hampshire. And even before beginning to make paper, negotiated rates on the railroads for freight to Boston and New York. Recognizing that he was developing a vast water power, he encouraged other manufacturers and even built structures to lease and sell to them. He built a machine shop for Osgood and Barker and a four-story building over the lower locks of the canal, at first housing woodworking shops. In 1873, they enlarged the building to house the Vermont Farm Machine Company. That's this building here. Um, in the summer of 1871, the Russells talked of opening the old branch of the canal that had been started but abandoned in 1837. In the fall of 1871, Jabez Hills died and Russell was now able to buy the land under the hill instead of leasing it. Russell was very good at forming alliances with the local business community. He showed genuine concern for the town. His father, who moved to Bellows Falls, was from Claremont, but had learned paper making in a mill in Wells River, which had been founded by someone who had apprenticed with Bill Blake. W.A. Russell was born in Wells River. By the 1860s, he was wealthy but accessible, and he encouraged other people to build mills. A.C. Moore, who had owned a mill in Bartonsville, started a mill in 1871. John Robertson and John T. Moore moved from Putney and built a mill to manufacture toilet paper. Edward Arms, from a prominent family of local merchants, entered the paper trade. And in the early 1880s, so did Wyman Flint. The Flint family had made its fortune in spices. The new business spirit in Bellows Falls was able to weather hard times. The, the depression starting in 1873 hit the local business community, but Russell used the opportunity in 1874 to enlarge the canal again. At the same time, the town agreed to spend $3,000 to build a stone bridge across the canal on Bridge Street. Russell promised that if the bridge exceeded its planned cost, the canal company would pay the balance. This was a handsome stone arch bridge with round arches. Later, it featured prominently in postcards of the canal. Mill development in the 1870s and 1880s took place at a dizzying pace. First, a little more about this photograph. Um, this is part of the Fall Mountain Paper Company. 
uh, a storage house, smokestack for the company, and another storage building for the canal, uh, uh, for the, the paper company here. This building is still standing. Um, it's the oldest paper mill uh, building um, standing in the village, built in 1875. Um, mill development in the 1870s and 1880s took place at a dizzying pace, creating a complex maze of buildings. This photograph is uh, from the 1890s. At the same time, the canal had to be continually enlarged. In 1879, dredging deep in the canal between five and eight feet. Again, the company raised the level of the dam. The area around the old lower locks was widened and deepened, providing ever increasing amounts of power to the Wyman Flint Mill, John T. Moore Mill, and various mills of the Fall Mountain Paper Company. The canal company also opened that old branch of the uh, canal um, that would uh, lead to two new mills, uh, the Morin Thompson Mill and the John Robertson Mill. This is the old Morin Thompson paper company here and the John Robertson paper company is here. By the end of the 1880s, the mill complex was mostly complete and the pace of development slowed. There were gradual developments. The canal company rebuilt the flume under the John T. Moore mill when it burst in 1893. In 1898, the canal was again deepened. But after 1898, with the consolidation of the International Paper Company, development stagnated. This was made worse by the death of W.A. Russell at the beginning of 1899. Russell's sons took over the canal company, but neither W.A. Russell Jr. nor Richard S. Russell seemed to have the enterprising spirit of their father. With the canal at its industrial peak, in some ways it was still picturesque. The bridges, especially on Bridge Street, were lovely and made handsome photographs, but this could not hide the fact that the canal was dangerous. A wrong step or an accident backing up a wagon could be fatal to people or horses. In 1891, a boy fell into the canal and the current carried him under the Bridge Street Bridge and almost into the racks, locking debris from entering the mill race. He finally was able to grab a pole and was carried to safety. In 1892, a man named John Hassett wasn't as lucky and was washed into the racks. Next year, when a man fell into the canal, he clung to the pilings on the edge until someone lowered a rope to save him. The Times commented that the cause was, quote, a load of tangle foot. A few months later, two horses fell into the canal when George Sabin, a local farmer, uh, accidentally backed his wagon too close. One horse was easily rescued, but the other was in greater danger. Finally, the Times reported, a drink of liquor poured down his throat, revived him. Uh, that is down the horse's throat. There were other stories and probably many not reported. A real photo postcard from about 1907 shows people pulling horses from the canal. At the time, people tended to take this danger in stride. Accidents in mills on the canal or driving logs over the dam were part of a dangerous life. This, uh, you can see the horses um, here. The next major development on the canal took place in 1908. The canal company replaced the old wooden dam with a modern concrete one. Again, the purpose was to increase water power. Already, the canal company seemed to be anticipating the development of hydroelectric power. Fall Mountain Paper had generated electric power since 1883. And in 1884, electric lights lit the stores in the square. In 1907, the canal company started to develop a dam it owned in Sumner's Falls in Heartland, Vermont for electric power. In 1910, 
during a strike in the mills, international paper company president, and a former resident of Bellows Falls, Alonzo N. Burbank, warned, quote, the company has propositions to use its power at its plants in Bellows Falls, Wilder, and Turner's Falls for electrical purposes, transmitting it by wire to important manufacturing centers. Finally, in 1912, Richard S. Russell sold the canal for $1 million to electrical developers Chase Harriman of Boston. This was troubling to people in Bellows Falls. The Times commented, the Bellows, Fall, Bellows Falls is largely indebted for its business prosperity and almost its, its existence to the canal. And anything that concerns the canal demands the attention of local people. Little changed on the canal immediately. The change came in 1926, after the last great strike against international paper, but the writing had been on the wall for a few years. In 1913, the Underwood tariff dropped duties on Canadian lumber and cheap grades of paper. International paper responded by developing mills in Canada, first in Trois Rivières, Quebec. In 1922, in the midst of the strike, Philip Dodge, who was then president of International Paper, wrote ominously to the Times, electric current is increasing in increasing demand throughout the country. Certain mills will be discontinued because a better profit can be obtained by utilizing the power to produce electricity. In August, 1925, the Times reported that International Paper announced that water power from the smaller mills would be diverted to hydroelectric. The deal came at the beginning of, of 1926. The town registered the deed transferring land and water power to the International Hydroelectric Corporation on January 8th. Um, the International Hydroelectric Corporation and Chase Harriman together formed the New England Power Company. It's a little set of photographs. The, the original is quite small, showing, um, showing uh, uh, the demolition of um, the international plant. Um, for a time, the Times expressed hope that part of the international paper mill would be renovated and reopened. But in October, the paper announced the gates to the canal near Bridge Street were shut down forever. By December, most of the international paper plant had been torn down and excavators uh, were blasting 110,000 cubic feet of rock from the riverbed below the falls. Through 1927, workers built the new dam excavated and paved the canal. The work delayed by the hurricane of 1927 was complete in the summer of 1928. And from um, this point on, this, um, the canal is as, as uh, we know it today, still a vital part to Bellows Falls and still the, the memory of the, of the earlier part of the canal is, uh, is tremendously important to the village. Um, but with the canal and the railroads, Bellows Falls for a time became a very prosperous town. Um, at one point, it had one of the highest uh, property valuations in the state. Um, well, thank you. And this is, uh, this is what I have for today. This one last photograph, just uh, highlighting the canal with the railroad above it. Uh, right at the north end of the canal. So thank you. And, uh, and thank you, David. Thank you very much for this uh, very informative talk. Uh, uh, it certainly has brought together a lot of the bits and pieces that I've come to understand uh, over the years about, uh, about the history of the canal and its place in, uh, uh, in, in, in the very soul of the community. I think that that was done very, very, very nicely. Uh, and thank everyone too for joining us uh, uh, today. Um, uh, 
in this in 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 this talk. And uh, I do want to uh, ask you ask folks maybe uh, to mark their calendars for future presentations uh, in our series uh, on Saturday, May twenty second. Uh, Bennington-based architectural historian Jane Griswold Rodocchio will uh, uh, help us understand how in 1787, the country builder General John Fuller laid out the timber frame for our town's meeting house uh, using simply uh, a knowledge of plane geometry, a straight edge, and a compass. Um, and on Wednesday, June 9th, the historian William Hosley will guide us through uh, uh, conservation of the Rockingham Meeting House Graveyard. Uh, I hope folks might be able to join us. Uh, uh, keep your eyes open for further details. And um, uh, until we all meet again, I want to wish everyone uh, a good day and I hope everyone uh, uh, stays well and stays safe. And again, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.